Thank you, Mac. Lydia, Dolly, thank you for your ministry this morning. Please take your Bibles, if you've still got them there. Well, I don't know where they would have gone in the last 10 minutes, but uh, one of those things pastors say that don't make a lot of sense when you stop to think about it. But if you've got a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 2, and I want to pick up really where that hymn leaves off. Uh, so we rise in faith and obedience. It, it isn't, sometimes it feels like this would be better. Let's just stay inside here. Let's just sing, pray, worship. Let's get in the gospel and, uh, you know, just receive all of the blessings and just kind of hold them in tight and close. And we need these moments, but we have to rise and head out from this moment. And that's really where the text that I want to share with you this morning takes us. In Acts 2, uh, beginning at verse 42, down to verse 47. Let me read that for you, then we'll pray, and we'll just uh, close off this chapter of our study in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Actually, let me back up into verse 40. With many other words, Peter warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Father, for our time together in your presence as your redeemed people, uh, the time sharing in these emblems, uh, the time just filling our minds and hearts and voices with praise, uh, time now in your word, all of this is a blessing for us because you are present with us by the Spirit. You're here, Father, for your gracious presence amongst us and within us. We thank you and pray now desperately, Father, that you would help us, that you would grow us, that you would change us, transform us. According to each need, Father, I just give every life into your hands, whatever it is they need to hear from you, Father. We ask that you would speak and give us ears to hear. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So in our study in the book of Acts, uh, we, we looked last time at Peter's first message, his evangelistic first e effort at evangelism uh, after the arrival of the Spirit, or really on the arrival of the Spirit there on the day of Pentecost, and how it is he bears witness to Jesus. That sermon I read, that, just, that little clip, gospel clip I read for you earlier on, how clearly having been given life and instruction and direction, uh, the power, the equipping to now be the witness for Christ, he points them clearly to Christ. The fulfillment of Jesus' promise, they would be his witnesses, beginning there and then to the ends of the earth. And that's certainly what Peter has done in his preaching. We might, in that moment, think then, bearing witness to Jesus is some kind of evangelistic proclamation, either like Peter with a crowd, or individually, that bearing witness to Jesus is communicating the gospel to another person. Now, that is bearing witness to Jesus, but bearing witness to Jesus is more than that. It's never less than that. In fact, you really haven't introduced anybody to Jesus until you tell them about him. You can show him and display him. We're going to talk about some of those things, but eventually you've got to get to the point with your unsaved friends and neighbors. We've got to tell them who he is and what he's done. So we have uh, an expanding, or, or maybe the lines are being filled in about what it means for us to bear witness to Jesus what it means for those who heard Peter's message and believed that message and were added to their number that day. What does it look like for them to now bear witness to Jesus? And again, while it is definitely Peter and the apostles in their unique apostolic role, preaching the gospel and seeing thousands saved, that is their bearing witness to Jesus. 
Luke also gives us, as he, he gives us this account of the early days of the church, he gives us these little summaries, these little descriptive sections of what's happening in the lives of those who come to know and trust the Lord Jesus. Not individually, but collectively as a community, what is taking place. These little sections, this one in particular, actually serves as a bit of an introduction. What he highlights here, actually we see more of this as we work through chapter 3 and 4. We will see miracles, we will see conversions, we will see uh, uh, the need to, to love and care for people who are hungry and so on. So it, it serves as a little bit of an introduction. But fundamentally what we want to see here is this early description of the believing community who are bearing witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Remembering that it is the Holy Spirit and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, or to put it better, the Holy Spirit's use of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that produces what we see described in this passage. This isn't something that Peter's created. They didn't get together and come up with a new kind of social club. It's not their idea. What we're seeing here described is what the Spirit who arrives on this day what the Spirit does with the gospel in the hearts of sinners like you and like me. He builds this kind of community. Acts will have much more to say about this community life, and the New Testament goes on to expand on what we see here. But at the very least, we want to be encouraged and instructed in the description of these early believers, or this early believing community, and we want to use it as a bit of a mirror for ourselves. Do we see our face in this description? That is, our face in this description. What did this community look like? Let me uh, just break it down into two parts. First, we want to think about what they did. That's verse 42. And then I'm going to describe what they experienced. Or we'll follow the text as it describes what they experienced in verses 43 to 47. Don't overemphasize those two headings. I just found that a helpful way to kind of understand the two parts of the passage. There are things they do in the second part, and there are things they experience in the first part, but fundamentally, I found it a little bit helpful. Hopefully, it's helpful for you. So verse 42, what does the believing community, what do they do? We're told in verse 42 that they devote themselves, having come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, having been al made alive by the Spirit, having been baptized by the apostles, they devote themselves to certain things. And that word devotion, and many of you have seen this and heard this word described many times. It's almost too familiar for us. Yes, yes, they're devoted to these things. The, the word represents a quality of heart uh, that is remarkable. They are continuing steadfastly, or they are continually continuing they are continually continuing to be committed to certain things. They are devoted to these things. Constantly, continually focused on and prioritizing their use of both their time and their personal resources around these priorities. These things immediately, by the work of the Spirit through the gospel, emerge as hallmarks of the believing community. Again, it doesn't say everything there is to say about these things. Acts will say more, and the epistles say a whole lot more. But we see it here at the very beginning. At the very least, we need to ask ourselves, what are we devoted to these days? Where is my focus? Where is my attention? What are my priorities? What am I continuing steadfastly in? What am I filling my mind and heart up with? And how does that work its way out in the prioritization of my, the use of my energy and my resources? What are you devoted to? If someone in your household or one of your coworkers or a neighbor, if I were to ask them, hey, what, is, what are they devoted to? If you had to describe one thing that was most important to them, what would the people who know you best describe? I don't know about you, but that's a little bit frightening for me to think about. And I don't mean it to intimidate, though I do trust the Lord will convict us each one. These people, because of the Spirit and the Gospel, are joined together in devotion, continuing steadfastly in these four things. One, 
the apostles' teaching. Simply put, the apostles were teaching what Jesus taught them. And what they are teaching, even as Jesus taught them, following his pattern of instruction, and we see it in Peter's first message, what they're teaching came from Jesus and is rooted in the Old Testament scriptures. Hopefully you'll remember, we just looked at it last time, that if you were with us, Peter's message isn't he pulled some thoughts out of thin air and said, here, this is what you, who Jesus is and what you should do. He, they want to know what's going on, the spirit and tongues and all of this, what's going on. And he goes back to the Old Testament and says, well, let me explain. God promised and now it's happening. He, what they're teaching is rooted in the Old Testament and is communicated as it has come to them from, in, and through the Lord Jesus Christ. To put it another way, I think what Luke is describing here is their commitment to the Word of God, to the very message of God. They understood quickly that what they were hearing from the apostles was from God. And there are New Testament, we won't take the time, it's a whole other sermon just to, to flesh out how very quickly the apostles understand and the New Testament believers understand that when they communicate certain things, even in writing, that they're not just communicating on their own, but the Spirit of God, in a unique way, is using them to communicate the truth of God. They are devoted to God's Word. 1 Peter 2, verse 2, describes believers craving pure spiritual milk. In the context, it's, it's a description of the heart, the desire of the child of God for that which will feed Grow, nurture. I don't know if you've been around a hungry child recently, a hungry infant recently who's decided it's time to feed. Uh, but they're devoted to one thing. They want some milk. They want some, they want some sustenance. They want their belly filled. In this spiritual sense, the devotion expressed in Acts 2 is a reflection of Peter's description in 1 Peter 2. These people are hungry for more. They are thrilled with what they know and understand, but they want more. They need to be fed. I won't read it for you. If you're taking notes, 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. Actually, I will read it. Turn there just for a minute. It, It is important to be reminded, all of us, of the value, the importance of God's words, that... I guess what I'm trying to say is these people aren't just devoted to God, the apostles' teaching because they had nothing better to do. Might as well, you know, they had no cable TV, there were no smartphones, so might as well listen to what these guys have to say. No, they are devoted uh, to the apostles' teaching precisely because of what the apostles' teaching is and what it does. And so we have this reference, and again, I'm making a leap here from their teaching to the equivalent of the apostles' teaching to Scripture. We can fill in those gaps if you have questions about how we understand the apostles' teaching to be inspired Scripture from God. Those are important questions. But I simply want you to see how Paul describes the word, the message that comes rooted in the Old Testament through the person and work of Jesus and the voice of the apostles. Verse 14, As you, Timothy, continue, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you've learned it. Talking about biblical truth. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let me cut to the chase. Are you devoted to the Word? Are you hungry for more? I have to apologize. I've made it a habit the last few years, and I forgot to do it this year. In January, at the beginning of January, of encouraging you all and even giving you all some suggestions for resources that help you read through the Bible in a year. I'm not going to ask you to raise hands or anything, but are you reading through Scripture systematically, regularly? You don't have to read. There's no prizes for reading through the Bible in 12 months. If you do it in 24 months, that's good too. The point is, God's people 
are devoted to his word in such a way that they want to hear it and they know they need to hear it even when they're not sure they are going to like what it is he has to say to them they still want to be in the word so let me encourage you if you don't have a regular pattern for yourself or your family being in the word on a daily basis taking you from genesis through don't skip the parts like leviticus that are hard plow through them too god will use those things All scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching and instruction and rebuke and for training in righteousness so that all God's people might be thoroughly equipped for every good work of service devoted to the scriptures. Two, they are devoted to the fellowship. In the NIV, it just has two fellowship, which makes it sound like they really enjoyed hanging out together at, you know, coffee lounges or whatever, uh, down at Tim Hortons, Um, and there's an element of that to this, but what's being described here, and some translation have it this way, they devoted themselves to the fellowship, that there's uh, the picture of this emerging community of Jesus followers, believers, within the larger Jewish community. Remember, there's still good Jewish people at this point in time. We're told they meet regularly in the temple. Within that Jewish community, there is now this emerging messianic community. It's that fellowship that they are now devoted to. That is, within their larger community and community connections, as good Jewish people in Jerusalem, they are devoted to the fellowship of those who know and love and follow Jesus as Messiah. To put it another way, the most important relationships these people have now are with other people who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. They are devoted to the fellowship. It speaks of relationship. That's described later on in what they experience. We'll touch on that. The word itself can be, uh, fellowship can be translated partnership. In fact, in the NIV in Philippians 2, uh, Paul uses it that way to describe the, the partnership of the Philippian believers with him in the gospel. He says they've been partners with him, fellowshipping with him in the gospel. Why? What's the connection? Well, you can use it as partnership because the idea is that uh, Jack and Mac, they're going to start a a business. They're going to sell ice cream cones or something down on the street corner in the middle of January. And uh, they're going to go into business together because they're passionate about this. They have this shared passion for this venture. And Jack, he knows everything about ice cream. You know, he knows how to make it right from milking the cows to developing the ice cream. And Mac, he's a, he's a marketer. He knows how to communicate all that. And he's got a computer and things. So Mac brings his computer, his marketing skills. And, and Jack brings his cow and whatever else you need to make ice cream. And they're going to pull that together. They're taking the resources they have. I've really just thrown you off with a really ridiculous illustration, haven't I? Just bear with me. They're two individuals who say, we're passionate about this thing, so I'm going to put in everything I've got, and he's going to put in everything he's got so that we can make a go of this joint venture. I think that's helpful when we think about the fellowship that these folks are now devoted to, this new community of believers in Jesus. They're bringing their resources, their very selves, and they're pooling them together for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think the best way I've seen this described is by Kent Hughes, his little book on, little expositional commentary on the book of Acts. It's very helpful. It's really his sermons written out. And uh, he describes, what does it mean to be devoted to the fellowship? It means you give yourself to others. Listen to how he describes it. Fellowship costs something in the early church. In contrast to our use of the word fellowship today, fellowship is not just a sentimental feeling of oneness. It isn't punch and cookies. It doesn't take, does not take place simply because we are in the church hall. Fellowship comes through giving. True fellowship costs. So many people never know the joys of Christian fellowship because they have never learned to give themselves away. They visit a church or a small group study with an eye only for their own needs, hardly aware of others, and they go away saying, well, there's no fellowship in that place. The truth is, we will have fellowship only when we make it a practice to reach out to others and give something of ourselves. I think that's a helpful description of this little phrase, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. The priority and the significance 
of our relationship together as brothers in Jesus and in Christ cannot be overstated. We'll come back to that in what they experienced in a moment. The third thing they're devoted to is the breaking of bread. And I'll describe this in this way. It's the Lord's Supper, what we just shared in, plus. There is much discussion whether this, some good godly people have argued this is talking about communion, what we've just done, the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. Uh, Others have argued that no, it's just talking about a large fellowship meal that they would have. Uh, They broke bread together, as is described later on. They broke bread in each other's homes. For a number of reasons, and I won't go into a long discussion of it, but fundamentally, given where this is placed and how it is he goes on to describe fellowship meals later on, I think we are meant to understand that this is the Lord's Supper, including a fellowship meal of some kind. And you can read all of 1 Corinthians 11 where you find out they were getting into all sorts of trouble because they were doing the big meal thing all wrong and they were hurting one another. And then out of that hurt and sin and pain, they were trying to celebrate the Lord's Supper specifically. And Paul says, you guys are doing so bad at this. God is killing some of you. It's in the passage, 1 Corinthians 11. You can read it for yourselves. So I think what we have in view here is the Lord's Supper plus. That is, there would be a larger meal of the gathered community, and within the context of that shared meal, they would share in the Lord's Supper. I would expect that to be in this section, to be honest with you. I would expect that that would be a priority given the instructions of Jesus. We just read them as they're given to us by Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. That they, in being prepared for the death of Jesus, they're being told, you need to do this in remembrance of me until I come. So it would, it would simply make sense. It's almost necessary that that would be part of the devotion of these early believers. It would likely have been one of the very first things they have been taught by the apostles as they're now in a discipling class. They're saved, they're baptized. What do we do now? Let's explain to you how we remember the death of Jesus for our sins regularly, however often they did that. And what I want you to understand is And we've emphasized this already this morning in practicing this. Uh, We are so easily distracted from the cross. And we are so easily moved to in blindness and self-righteous pride. We are moved to positions where we think, uh, we don't think it consciously, but we We speak and act as if we don't really need the cross. And Jesus gave us the Lord's Supper so that we might be reminded continually how desperately we need His cross. It's at the center of our life together as God's people. And if we lose that, we lose everything. That's why I've said before, I'm tempted to have communion every Sunday. And all the brethren folks said, Amen. I'm tempted. Now, I'm, I'm content with the pattern that we have, but brothers and sisters in Christ, are you devoted to those times, the time we spent today? Maybe I'm speaking to the choir, but are you devoted? Are the, these times so important that you will rearrange your schedule so to make sure that you are with God's people when they're sharing in the Lord's Supper, remembering and proclaiming His death until He comes? That's the third thing. And the fourth thing is prayer. Some would translate the prayers. They were devoted to the prayers. The idea being, it wasn't just a a general devotion. Yeah, we want to be a praying people. We're going to pray at home and in our closets and so on. Though that is a part of our Christian devotion and experience. They, They are devoted to the corporate activity and experience of prayer. A hallmark of God's people in the Old Testament. Read the Psalms and how they use the Psalms in their corporate worship together. Psalms, prayers, repeated examples in the book of Acts and the instructions in the epistle paint us a picture. Not only are you to be passionate in praying in your closet, that is, you should personally be engaged in prayer continually. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. 17, 18, it's in there. Uh, You must be passionate about prayer personally We are to be devoted to prayers corporately, that we pray together. 
That's Ken's invitation to the guys. Or if you're not a part of a small group, there's opportunities. If our small groups are anything, there to be places of fervent prayer for one another in this place. Our Sunday morning prayer time, 9.30, here at the church. We meet down by the kitchen. Please join us this afternoon, 4 o'clock. I'm not saying you have to be, or any one of us can be, at every moment the church, our congregation, has set aside for prayer. I'm just asking the question, are we devoted to prayer so that we even care enough to show up once in a while? They were devoted to prayer. It is a vital expression of a renewed heart in relationship with God. God's people love to pray. Now, these things are all necessary. Devotion to the word, devotion to the fellowship, devotion to the breaking of bread, devotion to prayer. What I mean is he's describing four things there that you can't pull any one of those things out and still have the same dynamic in the community. You're not going like, well, we got, we got three of four. Like last year, we only had two of four on this list, and now we're up to three of four, 75%. Man, for me, in science class in high school, that was great, 75%. No, no. What he's describing here of them, all of these things are part of who they are, and all of these things are to be a part of all God's people whenever and wherever they are together. They are all essential elements of our devotion. In fact, these things reflect the priorities of a gospel-centered people where the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is truly understood and cherished and proclaimed, these are the things that will, by entailment, by necessity, these are the things that will be marked amongst those people. The gospel binds us together. These are the evidences of the gospel's impact on our lives. Let me just read for you a quote from Don Carson. He describes kind of the centeredness of this around the gospel in a very helpful way. What binds the church together is not common education or common race or common income levels or common politics or common nationality or common accents or common jobs or anything else of that sort. Christians come together because they have been loved by God, saved by faith in the finished work of Jesus himself and sealed by the Holy Spirit. The church is a band of former enemies of God who are now adopted and loved and who love one another for Jesus' sake and the glory of God. Their devotion to these things reflects that understanding of the church. Again, we, we praise God that we are that in his mercy, but we need to strive for that. You understand what I mean? that we hold this passage up as a mirror and we go, yes, we see the evidence of God's grace saving us and putting us together, and I do see that evidence. If I didn't see that evidence, I would simply keep preaching the gospel till you guys got saved. But I believe that you are saved. And we see the evidence of God's grace pulling us together and molding us into this kind of community. But we strive for more. What they experienced... First, we're told in verse 43, they were filled with awe, wonder, at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. They were filled with awe. The apostles, and this is again is introductory, we're going to see them perform miracles. The miracles have an effect on this community and the surrounding community. It humbles them. The word translated awe here could be translated fear. Not that they were afraid, but there was a reverence. There was a recognition. The miracles, simply put, were, were God's fingerprints endorsing, validating the ministry, the, the word ministry of the apostles. The miracles were to get the, those first Jewish people get their attention. This is of God. These guys are speaking for God. We better pay attention to what they're saying because look at the divine power that's being expressed in these miracles. The miracles have an effect of getting people's attention, not for the miracles' sake. It is important to see in this passage that they are not devoted to miracles. They are grateful for them, and the miracles have a profound effect. But the miracles are to get their attention so that they might hear the word of Christ. 
When you take the word of Christ, wedded to that apostolic miracle ministry, what you have is a sense of great reverence and awe and fear that rests upon the people. God is in this place. And so they were filled with awe and reverence. That their life together, even as they observed this unique apostolic expression of miracle working, their life together was, was serious. Precisely because... The living God was present among them. It's a serious business when God is present. Secondly, they experienced generosity. Verses 44 and 45. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions and gave to everyone who had need. Uh, Just to be clear, it's not not promoting communism. (laughs) It doesn't say they sold all of their possessions and set up a commune somewhere outside of Jerusalem. No, what it's describing is, the again, another effect of the gospel, this thing that they experienced, was a heart that was turned away from its own needs and turned towards the needs of others. And they took what they had, and they they looked out, and they said, there's a person in need. Well, maybe I don't have financial resources in my pocket, but I've got some property over here. I've got an extra donkey I can sell, and I can use that, and I'm going to use that to help meet a need over here. That's what they're describing. Almost a spontaneous, a Holy Spirit-fueled spontaneous generosity. If there's somebody in need amongst them, they're going to be taken care of. And so this generosity is experienced. Do you see how it's experienced in two directions, though? Usually we just put ourselves on one side of this thing. Oh, I'm supposed to be generous. Well, that's true. If you love Jesus, if you know what he's done for you, you will be a generous person with everything in your pockets. And if you're not generous, you better examine your heart and see if you understand the gospel. Generosity is to be a part of who we are. That's being described here. But you see also that the generosity is towards their brothers and sisters in Christ. The generosity is experienced both in the giving, but it's also experienced in the receiving. It's a beautiful picture of mutual care within this new community of Messianic Jesus followers. They take care of one another. They experience awe and wonder, reverence, seriousness. They experience generosity. They experience great joy. 2 and verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Just one comment on that descriptive Uh, description of their activity they were still going to temple to do their regular temple things and they would also go there for part of their meetings there was a porch area around the exterior where various groups of various kinds would come and have discussions and studies and so on and so they're meeting in the temple area as an identifiable community they're meeting together they're practicing jews but they're messianic jews so they're meeting together to talk about jesus in that context, how, what are their meetings described like? Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Let me tie this to the next phrase. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Everything they did was marked by gladness and sincerity. And there's a little more that I'd like to talk. That word translated sincere is an interesting one. It, it, it literally means without stones. And it's the only place in the, in the Bible where it's used. Uh, and it's rightly described sincerity, but it, I think it has to do with not allowing anything to get in the way of this joy-expressed community life. It's sincere. It's, there's nothing disturbing it or unsettling it or that would raise a question about it. There are no bumps or rocks in that sense. The, the point I want to stress is, out of that sincerity, there is great gladness. They are marked by joy, praising God, it says. I know it's hard, and this is, it seems really unfair in the day and age we live in. And I've said it before very recently, and I will likely say it again. It pops up in Scripture so often. Whatever the day, whatever the challenges, whatever the successes, whatever the failures, God has rescued us so that we might experience His joy every moment of every day. I don't. And you don't either. But that is what he has saved us for. 
do we experience in our life together gladness of joy out of the sincere hearts? They were marked by joy. And finally, they experienced growth. It says uh, they met together in their homes, a glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That phrase, that little description, enjoying the favor of all the people, the larger Jewish community at this moment, and this is going to change, there's some important lessons coming in the next few chapters, but at this moment, they're looking in at what is happening in this new community within the community, and they're going, boy, that looks pretty good. I think it means something like that. They're enjoying the favor. They're looked on favorably that their life together is attractive to the larger Jewish community at this moment. And I think that's where we pick up our lesson in bearing witness to Christ. That all that they do and all that they experience when blessed by the Spirit of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, all of that becomes very attractive to the community around us. That's what God does. Yes, I'm bearing witness to Jesus. I'm preaching the gospel to you. If you're not a believer, you need to turn from your sin and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's evangelistic. That's bearing witness to Jesus. But if you thought about this, not only individually as you head out the door tomorrow or as you head home from here, as you pick up you know, coffee at Tim Hortons and interact with someone there or you have a chat with somebody in the driveway when you get home or tomorrow morning when you're at work, in all of those interactions, you are an extension of this believing community. You're part of this body. You're like a big toe or whatever part you want to choose to be. I mean, you can't choose to be the part you are, but whatever picture in your mind is most encouraging, you're a part of us. And you're going to go out from us, and if our community life together is even close to what it's supposed to be according to this passage, you're going to be a fruitful servant for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not on your own. Together we scatter And in God's mercy, I pray this. Lord, make us attractive. I'm not talking about us changing things so that people will like us. I mean, when we live out the gospel and all the beauty of who Christ is and the power of his transforming work, when we live that out together in this way, Lord, make that attractive to our friends and our neighbors. Oh, Father, help them to see how beautiful it is to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Burden their hearts. Give them a longing to come and join us. Our life together at its best. He makes us into a radiant, believing community of witness for Jesus. You might even say, we are the light of the world. You see, there's an organic evangelistic effect and impact of the gospel as God saves us and brings us into community. It's the Holy Spirit and the gospel that makes us into this radiant, believing community, drawing others to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we must always remember as we pursue these things in His mercy that it is the Lord who daily adds to the number those who are being saved. There's no credit for them in this. They are who they are by the grace of God, and they are useful in expanding the church because of the grace of God. Oh, I hope... And maybe you can join me this afternoon to make this part of our praying that God would use us, grow us in more and more into this kind of community and that wouldn't it be amazing? He could do this. He could do this if daily there were people being saved in connection to our church family and our community. Daily there was a co-worker there or a nephew over there or a neighbor over there. But wouldn't it be wonderful if the Lord in his mercy blessed our collective witness for Jesus and the gospel itself and daily we heard stories of sinners coming to faith in Christ. Would you long for that? He could do that. He has done that. We haven't seen it quite daily yet. But we have people sitting here now who two years ago would not be sitting here. Amen? Oh, that God would make us into a radiant community drawing others that he might add to the number of those who are being saved. This is what the Spirit produces through the message of Jesus. A believing community that is devoted to Christ, continually speaking and living for Christ, that by his grace alone, 
they might, they might be used for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, that God might make us into, those, into that community in these days. Mac, please lead us in our closing song.